basketball coach of all time. Uh, between 1963 and 1975, he was responsible for our leading uh, the UCLA basketball team to win 10 out of 12 national championships. This was unheard of. This was unprecedented. And so his success on uh, leading teams on the basketball court was renowned. More importantly, though, was the relationship he built with his players, the influence he had on those around him. He was known as someone who inspired those around him and encouraged them to achieve success out on the basketball court, but more importantly in life, and to do that through integrity, through character, through teamwork. Several presidents of the United States have cited his influence on them, on who they've become and who they continue to want to be. Coaching is powerful. I believe that all of us in our own way are thirsting for, seeking for our own version of John Wooden in our lives. I also believe that we long to be this type of person to others. And it certainly influenced my thoughts on coaching who I want to be and what I want to be to others. Now coaching in our industry, in our community, is actually something fundamentally new. Uh, I did a quick Google trend search to see, you know, when did this term agile coach come about? Um, and uh, it's actually, as of 2006, 2008, 2011 even, the term agile coach barely even existed. Nobody was even searching for it. And then from that point, it goes on this exponential curve upwards up till this, you see this giant spike in the, in the past year in terms of just, you know, an, as an anecdote of, of um, interest in, uh, in the term. And so coaching in industry, coaching in our workplaces is a relatively new phenomenon. And I like to do a little experiment here. Um, so let's just, let's just do a test. So um, if you are currently a um, team member, so like a, a, let's say a programmer or a QA, um, so other than, a, other than a scrum master, could you, could you stand up? Someone who has a, uh, someone who's a team member, just stand up for a moment, please. All right, uh, thank you, you can sit back down. Um, who is an agile coach of some kind? Maybe that's a consultant, maybe that's an internal coach. Uh, stand up. Wow, fantastic, okay. Uh, Sit back down, please. Um, any scrum masters who didn't include themselves in the previous category, could you please stand up? I, I'm going to use uh, Lisa Adkins' kind of um, uh, mindset, which is scrum masters are uh, a, a flavor of an agile coach. Uh, thank you very much. You can please sit down. And finally, if uh, you are in management, maybe you, um, uh, maybe you might be responsible for hiring a coach or, or choosing scrum masters um, or something like that. Could you please stand up? Great, thank you very much. So you can see that in some way, this thing that did not exist six years ago, more or less, has now impacted all of us in, in, in some way, most of us in some way. And like all things that kind of uh, uh, move really quickly, I think from time to time it, it makes sense to stop and think about, well, how did we get here? And what exactly are we getting ourselves into? Where is this going? In five years from now, 10 years from now, what does it mean to have multiple generations of employees in a company and, 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 an, and a coaching organization in a company? And you uh, think through that, do that mental exercise. 10 years from now, what, what happens? over time as people uh, grow up in that environment? What does it mean and where, where are we going with it? 
I'm going to ask this question because uh, I was a coach. I fell into coaching by accident. Uh, I was passionate about software. Um, I was actually in product management uh, for a company. Um, and I had experienced the trials and tribulations of working in an incredibly bureaucratic organization and being completely unable to deliver, solve problems and build things and get them in people's hands. And then I go somewhere else and, I, and, and I'm told, we do Agile here and we'll teach you about it. I, I even knew about the term coaching and I said, uh, wow, if I can help a new different group of people come to experience this kind of great working environment, then sure, I'll do it. And I had no idea what I was doing. And I made lots of mistakes, I'm excited to learn about new things and try new things, and they just ate it up and they, they ran with it. And uh, it was very, rewarding to me to be part of that community. But like all good things, it came to an end in the sense that, fortunately, I had the opportunity to uh, be part of a larger organization, so I start spreading my wings. I start coaching elsewhere, other teams all over the world, and you know, working all the way up with uh, vice presidents and executive voter on the team. which was especially scary because I had actually never held a job as a programmer in about 15 years. Um, it, the only job I had a programmer was my very first entry level job, which I held for a, a year or so. And since then I've been doing product management and all these other things. So then suddenly to be thrust in the team of experienced, uh, knowledgeable, skilled programmers was terrifying. But fortunately, there were wonderful people, very competent, very eager to do, uh, do a good job and, and, and welcome me in, and, and I, I very much thank them for that. But now I'm in this interesting situation of, like say, eating my own dog food. There we go. Um, if, you, if you're not familiar with this phrase, it basically means that if you had to eat the food you fed, fed your dog, you would have a much different appreciation for what your dog has to deal with, and you might be feeding them different, uh, different food. And so here I was as a uh, uh, renounced Agile coach, now being part of a team and having to follow all the things that I had been practicing and preaching uh, over the previous years. And going into that, I don't think I was fully appreciative or prepared for exactly what that would be like. And so I'd like to share a little bit of the story today and then having gone through this being part of a team, some realizations that I came to, how it uh, influenced my thought process, um, but also why I wasn't necessarily successful as a coach, uh, was a, as um, I couldn't achieve that same success as a coach. Why did I make that decision? I, I couldn't quite understand, I hadn't quite uh, figured out why I had not been able to be successful. And I think that uh, having been on a team again gave me some new insights. And I'm going to leave that discussion till later. But I think this uh, whole scenario, I'm, I'm, it's a bit of a cautionary tale. And I think it's a cautionary tale on, on a couple fronts. One, on a personal level, for, for you coaches out there, for you scrum masters, for those who might be aspiring to be that, um, to think about what it would be to practice what you preach, eat your own dog food, uh, what, it likes, what it's like to be on the other side. The second aspect is, where are we going as an industry as a community, where is this coaching thing taking us? And so when I was not, when I, when I joined the team again, um, working on some legacy code, 15, 20 years old, which is a great intellectual challenge in of itself, it was very intellectually stimulating, uh, very interesting challenges we were working on, and there were some things I absolutely learned to hate I hated stand-ups. 
I despise them. Because here I was working on some challenging technical problem. I was up at night in my bed, you know, or playing with my kids and totally distracted because there was some problem going through my head and I couldn't figure it out. And I'd wake up early the next morning and come into the office because I thought I had figured it out. And then I'd start coding and then I would break all my tests and be, you know, uh, two minutes away from being able to fix it. And then everybody stop and you'd be ripped out of the environment. It's time to have the stand up now. And so I'd stare at my feet as the problem's churning through my head. And you're completely ignoring what everybody else is saying because frankly it makes no difference to what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, because they're all working on different stuff. It's irrelevant to me and I say my two bits and I just wait and long for this thing to be over. So I didn't really hate the stand up. What I really hated, what I really hated was these distractions from coatings where I got to stare at my shoe and completely irrelevant what I was trying to the problem I was trying to solve. I loathe the retrospective. So it's Friday. I want to go, I know if I don't solve the problem, I'm going to go home on the weekend and it's going to be burning through my head while well, I'm trying to spend time with my family and my kids and I want to get this thing, you know, this code checked in and have that sense of satisfaction, solve the problem and then I'm ripped out of that world. Time to have the retrospective. We need to get meta. We need to get meta and think about, you know, how we interact and all these things. Like, I'm not thinking about that. I'm trying to, I'm like, I, 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 th I agree it's important. Absolutely, I agree it's important, but I haven't been thinking about that. I'm not prepared for that. I've got something else on my mind. And you think about, so, you know, how we interact with each other and have to navigate all these social cues and issues with, with people. And as wonderful as they are, they're great people, yet it's still challenging to, you know, kind of have to, it's a, it's a very vulnerable thing to be in a retrospective, right? And it was really frustrating when you know that there was the elephant in the room. Well, there's not one elephant, there's multiple elephants in the room. So if you see me afterwards, please ask me about my, my uh, experience with actual elephants here a couple years ago. <laughs> it involves an electric fence and the power going out. Um, Uh, I was in a tree, I was okay. <laughs> My coworkers were in the hut on the ground, I think I had. Um, and so, the things that, the elephants in the room, the, the years and years of legacy code that was holding us back because it really needed a redesign, but nobody was willing to do it, we never talked about that. The, the fact that there was all these organizational issues and product management and we weren't actually getting feedback from the customer. No, we weren't going to talk about that. The fact that we had great, wonderful people, but we still hadn't developed the rapport to, to really trust each other and tell each other what we really thought and meant because that is such a, it requires so, so much vulnerability we hadn't yet established, but we didn't talk about that because it was Friday afternoon, we were thinking about coding, and we weren't probably going to check, affect those things anyways. And so it was really frustrating to be, you know, here. And so here I was, sullen, you know, impatient, just let me get this thing over with. And then I despise the estimates. I have no clue how long this thing is going to take. Because every time I do something, I'm like, oh yeah, this is easy, you know, no problem. I just got, I'm changing it from like a string to an integer. I mean, how hard could that be, right? Like, Suddenly you've like hit spider webs out into every, you know, far reaches of the code and you're like, wow, this blew up really quickly. And frankly, whether it was going to take a day or two months didn't make a difference because we're going to have to do it anyways and it's not going to impact any decision. And probably most of all, I, I abhorred the concept of being coached. I was terrified now that I was no longer officially a coach, that the company would take a coach and then now like insert them on the team and say, here's your, here's your official coach now, because who the heck would they be to tell me how to be productive as a programmer? And fortunately they had the force not to do this, and this didn't happen, but it was this perpetual fear. And then I have to think about, well, I don't think I'm really alone. 
So after I've told you all of that about how I'm so forlorn and frustrated and patient meetings and just, you know, and all these ceremonies, all these things that I've been telling people to do for years as, as an Agile coach, who would actually want me on their team? Hands up if you would want me on your team. Okay. <laughs> you can't say that. You're leaving me. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a... Uh, I probably fit all the criteria of someone who'd be a, you know, an, an awful, awful team member if it was by the criteria of how engaged they are in these meetings. But the thing was is I don't think I was alone. I think I was just new. I looked around at the other programmers and, and I don't think they like these things anything, any more than I did. I really don't. I think they had just learned to live with it. I think they just learned that that was what was expected and it was just easier just to go with the flow. And so it wasn't fundamentally that I had eaten my own dog food, gone to the other side of the fence, walked in under someone else's shoes. Even having been as a product owner on a team before, before being a coach, had not adequately prepared me for what I was going to experience um, actually being a coder on a team. And so there was this newfound empathy that made me realize how, uh, how ineffective I, it really is to try and accomplish change and influence people when you haven't walked in their shoes. And it made me think, well, how did I get here in the first place? So going back to my coaching days and my time, uh, my time coaching and, and when I, once I became disillusioned, made me think more and realize uh, and consider um, how, why didn't that work? Why wasn't I as successful as I was hoping I was going to be? And so how did my coaching usually go in a, in a big multinational uh, company? Um, I was having successes and then you would get an executive, important person um, somewhere come along and say, hi, Sean, I've heard good things. I've got these teams. I want you to come coach my teams. Wow, fantastic. I'm doing good things. My name's getting out there. I, I can be useful. I can help people. People want my input. This is, this is really good feeling. I'm eager, excited, up for the challenge. And I would say yes, and I would I would try and do my best. But what's the problem with this statement? Thank you. Every time I would go and work with a team, universally, I'd Walk it, I'd, I'd find an environment where people were behaving perfectly rationally in the context that had an environment that had been created for them. There was always universally these smart, motivated people who want to come to work and be successful on a given day. Nobody doesn't want that. We all want to work, come to work and be successful. They all wanted to come to work and everything they were doing made total sense. It wasn't always the right thing, but it was the right thing given the questions that people were asking them, what management had been asking them, uh, how people had been rewarded in the past, how people had been disciplined in the past, the language that was, we were used at work, the things they were asked to keep track of. All of these things led them to behave in perfectly rational ways. And so I love this quote from David Marquet is, don't try and change the people, change the environment. And so, once you kind of come to this realization that, yeah, people are motivated, they want to do work, they want to do good stuff, they want to code, they want to solve problems, just as I did. It's the environment around them. And so you say, well, who's responsible for the environment? Who's responsible? Everyone contributes to it, but my view is that buck always stops with the leadership. So I go back to manager, or executive, or whoever, say, and come up with some polite way of trying to diplomatically say, like, 
I think perhaps maybe, you know, I could coach you. Um, and what's the type of response, and they don't necessarily say it exactly like this, but you kind of get the gist. What's, what's the type of responses you'd expect to get in that situation? Well, I, I, I don't have time. I, I don't have time, right? I, um, I, I know this Agile stuff. I was the one who hired you. Clearly I know this stuff because, right? Uh, and, you know, really, it's the teams that need to be whipped into shape. I, I don't know time, how many times I've heard, the teams need to be whipped into shape. I'm a student of leadership. I'm not, I don't pretend to be a good leader, but it's something I strive for. And so I spend a lot of time thinking and observing and learning all I can. And so there's a few principles of leadership. And so when someone sends the message, whether it's explicitly or even implicitly, that they're not willing to accept coaching for themselves, but they're willing to tell their teams to accept it, what message does that send? Leading by example. They just modeled behavior. They just said that it is okay for me to think that I already know Agile. It is okay for me to say that I am too busy to learn anything more. It's okay for me to reject being coached. It's okay for me to not have the humility to accept that maybe I need to change some of the things I'm doing. And so you cannot be surprised when anyone below them follows that lead. You can't blame them for it. And so I was in the situation where I had my mental vision of myself as this wise yogi on the mound who could, you know, dispense, dispense wisdom as an agile coach, where I think many times when I was asked to coach teams, this is uh, to, to quote unquote whip teams into shape, and now having the experience of being on a team, I can fairly say that the team that I was sent in to work with was thinking, you know, oh great. <laughs> Who is he to tell us what to do? And he's not coding, right? And so I think this very you know, succinctly described how I ended up where I was. And it made me realize that as much as an eager I was to try and go in and help teams and to help them experience, uh, you know, the, the, um, the joy I had in building things and solving problems. If I get asked to coach by someone who's not willing to get, receive coaching themselves, if I say yes, not only am I going to have, the only thing I can possibly do is teach someone a process. And that's oftentimes what they always say. You can go in with a team, but you can't change much of the, or the ecosystem around them. The process is the non-controversial parts, really. That's what you think people are expecting to do. And so I'm really limited to do that. And by kind of accepting that, every time you would do that, I real came to the realization that my coaching to a certain degree, little by little, was enabling an abdication of leadership. It's saying these values, these agile values and principles things, or even the agile process as it was so often called, that's not my responsibility as a leader. That has no influence on any of the decisions or the behaviors or the words and actions I take as a leader. Not at all. No, no, that's the agile coach's job. Please work with the team. You whip them into shape. Teach them the process. That's your job. And you multiply that over time. Compound that generation over generation of leaders and managers of your organization. And Think about where does that end up five, ten years from now? When we don't have organizations where leaders realize that, ah, I should lead by example. And so I think here be dragons. I think we have fundamentally agile will fail in the long term until 
we embrace this leadership by example. Coaches, scrum masters, if you're not willing to go take that leap and that scary, terrifying leap to do something you've never done before and be a team member and experience and walk in their shoes and, and code something that you've never, you've never coded before, but to gain that sense of empathy and establish the rapport with the people you are influencing that challenge to influence from within. If you're an executive management of some kind of a company who's not willing to seek coaching for yourself, first, lead by example. Don't ask others to do something you're not willing to do yourself. So take that first step, demonstrate vulnerability, and I think when we do that, we have a hope that these values and principles that we talk about all the time actually have a chance of catching on and sticking. Because it's not just about what we're doing today, it's about when that new employee starts tomorrow, and then they get promoted, and they get promoted, and 25, 30 years from now, they're the CEO. Do they know the agile values and principles in such a way that they can apply them in the decisions and the behaviors and the words and the actions of being a CEO. So that education starts tomorrow. So thank you. Um, I, I'm actually paying attention to what I'm doing for time. Holy smokes, I talk fast there. Um, <laughs> uh, so I think I talked a lot faster than I thought I was going to talk. Um, I have lots of time now to answer questions, I suppose. Um, I'd like to say that uh, it's been a bit of a, you know, a, a bit of a long kind of tumultuous uh, journey and there's a lot more details and things that went on to it, but I, I, I do want to thank um, a lot of the support I've had um, over the years in, in, in all roles and, uh, and you know, Chris and, and Todd are both in the, the room here uh, today, so um, I, I really have to give them a lot of uh, thanks to being, um, I, I, I mentioned at the beginning of, um, of uh, Coach Wooden and, and his influence on people and being an inspiration for who they, who they want to be in life, not just in work, but who they want to be in life, not in terms of what you achieve, but in terms of integrity and character, and I have to thank those gentlemen for in many ways being that to me. Um, so. Uh, yes, questions. Yes. The sense, so to say, being the coach as well as one of the team members mentioned that you did a stand up, you didn't like it, just like this. What do you suggest we do as coaches? I mean, we're looking at it from one point of view. And That's a fantastic question. Um, so the question was I complained about all these things, but what do you do about them? Um, so, one thing is understanding what the purpose of them is to begin with. Uh, so, because then we have the knowledge to say, well, what are we trying to achieve here? And, and, and fundamentally, what can we do as a team to achieve it? And that's, and that's one of the first things is the team knowing that they have the authority to, to change that. Um, you know, I, I think I've... <laughs> Todd, you know, we've, we've worked with teams before where they say, uh, oh, we hate this stand-up. And I remember Todd saying, well, why don't you change it? And they're like, what, we can change that? They just did not know that was something within their, their power to change. And so, um, what's the purpose of it? The purpose is, hey, we're all working on, the, if we're working on the same thing, let's not be distracted by meetings that are interrupted. They're actually meant to prevent the context switching problem anyways. Like, you know, uh, four hour long meetings that interrupt your day and you never get anything done. Um, but they don't make a lot of sense if you're not actually working on the same thing. Right? If they're just a status report, and that might be fine. There were cases where we weren't legitimately working on the same thing, and that was okay based on what we were doing. But then you need it if we're not actually collaborating. 
Um, and sometimes we did and sometimes we weren't. The other thing is, is actually working on the same thing. And that was something we actually did start to change. And actually influencing from within was probably a more powerful way to do that. Rather than being a coach telling people to do, but actually being a team member and saying, hey team, I noticed this, I hate this, do you hate it as much as I do? Let's try something different. Um, and so we would start, we say, oh, well, we're gonna start working on the same stuff. Like not just like your story, your story, your story, your story, but we're gonna work on the same story together. And now we actually have something to talk about. And then our stand-ups expanded to half an hour, 45 minutes even sometimes. And like, oh my goodness, that breaks all the scrum rules. But the thing is we actually were all legitimately talking about the, pro the technical details about the problem we were solving. Um, retrospectives, um, I think there's some good suggestions of um, keeping track as you go along the week. I think one of the big problems I had personally was that you're just not mentally prepared for it and you forgot about all the stuff you were thinking of. So we started keeping track with sticky notes and putting them on the whiteboard. Every time you ran into some frustration, the frustration was obviously like, this class is this is awful. Like this, this, this code right here is just like, like holy stuff. Like every time I run into this, it's a so sticky note, put it on the board, and now you actually have something to remember um, at the end of the week. So little things like that uh, helped. Um, uh, Chris and I actually took the team um, off site and we started doing retrospectives kind of in the, the, the neighborhood restaurant. And there is a big, I think a big shift in mentality once we actually got off site and it was kind of more of a social setting. We got, you know, a little bit more, you know, informal. Um, we realized that we're not going back to the office at the end of the day. Um, so, um, and established more of the rapport with each other. That helped, that helped you for us. And I'm not saying that'll help for everybody, but for our team, that, um, that made a difference. Yes, I agree with you, yeah. Um, you have to have the same commonality of language. And fundamentally, these are like values and principles that are organizational wide. Right? You can't just have them isolated to some group. And so now if you're the CEO, you're thinking about like, how would I behave differently? How would I make decisions differently with these things in mind? And that change isn't gonna happen overnight. Um, and it takes training and it takes coaching. And then fundamentally, we're gonna, leaders are all gonna have to learn how to pass that knowledge on. So it's, it's tough. But I absolutely agree with you. Yeah. So the question is, is, you know, there's an agile transformation in a company and one of the first steps is hire agile coaches. Is, the right, is that the right thing to do? I don't believe that, so there's terrific agile coaches around there. Wonderful, wonderful, really talented people. Um, I, I don't have anything against them. I mean, I was, you know, not talented, but I was one myself. I think that there's a transient place for coaching in an organization. Um, because, as you say, there, it's a big shift. Um, and it's, um, and, and you need kind of that outside expertise, different way of thinking, the different ideas brought in. But if that's kind of, if you have a standing coaching organization forever and ever and ever, and the leaders never like learn that it's something that they have to do, um, I think that's, I think that's a smell. I, I don't see how that's sustainable. Uh, who gets coached? I think it's okay for the employees to get coached, but I think, again, you have to lead by example. If you want agile in organization, leaders up the chain start with them and say, I need coaching first, in my opinion. 
start with me. I will, I will readily admit that I don't know everything I need to know about this. I need to change. I need someone to help me. And then that sets the example so when the coach comes in to help employees, it says, well, we're, we've, we've been shown that this is safe to do. Let's go back. So my question is not so tough, but it's simple. We know that Agile is not I mean, new. It's like 10 years back, I have studied it. But now I see that Agile is way more going on. So can you just share what's the success story you think in Agile which bringing us together, I mean, so now, I mean, so much that, you know, we are believing in Agile. Hmm, right. Um, the question is, there some success stories that really, like, made me believe in, in, in Agile, um, and that, you know, it's getting, you know, it's not a new concept anymore, and I think Josh talked about that as, at his keynote this morning, too. Um, so, one challenge I think we face is that more and more people are coming out of school and never having worked in a true waterfall organization. I have. I worked in a very bureaucratic organization that had, you know, and I wrote requirements documents that were thousands of pages long and no work could begin till it went through a phase gate. And so I experienced all the pain and frustration and lack of building things and solving problems that went with waterfall. And so when I actually got a chance to be like agile, oh, this makes sense to me. Um, I can I can see, I, I know the problems we're trying to solve. But we're in a situation now where people come out of school, go into the workforce, and the first thing they see is an agile organization. They haven't seen the problems it was trying to solve. And so um, to a certain degree, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but but you need to take the time to teach the history a little bit to, to help realize that not everybody's going to have the same exposure to uh, waterfall and why, you know, why that doesn't necessarily work and why do we do something different. Um, the success stories, um, I think the success stories I had and the, it, 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 the teams I worked with initially were quite similar. When I went in and started working with teams, they were frustrated by um, um, projects that would fail. You know, they would spend months and months and months working on a project and it would just be nothing but pain and frustration. And then they'd spend months and months and months putting in work and something that would just get thrown out at the end of the day because they did a, did a bunch of design and then it didn't go anywhere or they gave it to customers and then the customers didn't care about it anymore. And so the concept of, oh, we can actually, we can actually solve some of those problems. We can actually focus on um, building things and solving technical problems and giving it to people and seeing how they like it. Um, that may, I think that made a big difference. And I think that yeah, that's last question. Yeah, um, regarding um, this uh, agile coaching episode, you know, and uh, the different bad ideas that you mentioned when you were team and saw the challenges. Um, that's what my question is about. That when you are a coach, how would you be understanding? <coughs> Challenges of the team when they, the team is working together, and what would be the day of a giant motion like? Yeah. Because you're sitting outside, how do you know the challenges and how do you find a solution? <laughs> That's a really great question. How does an agile coach know the challenges of the team, and, and what are you looking for? I found that most of the most of the real things that the challenges I picked up were did not come out in the stand up did not come up in the planning or the retrospective meetings. Um, you couldn't, as, I couldn't as a coach lie, we just like fly in and swoop in to go to a team's meetings and, and really determine what their challenges were. Most of it ended up being, and having been on a team, I think I really appreciate this now, was the day-to-day -day interaction, the way we made decisions. Like, oh, well, we're going to, um, we're going to cut some corners on doing this code because of some external pressure. Um, that doesn't show up in those types of meetings. And so I do believe pretty strongly that you need to be embedded somehow. Um, and then I personally kind of look at agile coaches as being the um, leadership coach for the team, whoever that team leader is, to help them see like, well, wait a second, did you realize that 
you know, your team just decided that they're going to just do something because it can, means they can get it done, this, you know, this sprint, is that really the right thing to do over the long term? Maybe we need to communicate to them how important it is to, you know, for maintainability or to help each other out uh, if they're not, if they're not, uh, if they're too focused on their own work and not um, transferring knowledge and helping their team members. So, uh, I, I, I don't know if I answered your question, but I think embedding is, is pretty important. Uh, so I think that was... Um, I'm coming to the same thing as in coming, how do you embed it with the team leaders? Is there a lot of communication with the team leaders or the team leaders? Just giving it them like, um, is there a problem that there's a conversation with them? Again, then that's also kind of uh, limited because then it's on the scale of that leader to identify those problems. So, I mean, how do you get to that problem? Yeah. And that's a, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of aspects to that. So I'd be happy to chat about that afterwards and, and maybe learn about your context a little bit more. And um, yeah, and if anybody's interested in, in chatting with me afterwards, uh, I really appreciate it. This is my third time in India now. I think I spent a total of eight weeks here or so in the past three years. So I really enjoy it. I like coming back every year. year so uh, thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to talking to you.